for discussing with colleagues who work in the field across different themes and to get to know a little bit more about their own work, but also about how they approach scholarship, about, uh, on one hand, the, the um, academic scholarly side of things, how they approach a particular project, how they chose theoretical or methodological angles and talk about uh, implications or, or relevant aspects about their works, but also to get to know the researcher behind the work. You know, the, as we know, we sometimes we read a book, we read an article, and, and we see the name and say, well, uh, who is behind that, that article or book? What's the thinking? What motivates um, these scholars? Well, that's what Chaplimos was created for. And we're very proud that uh, it's already, I think, Manuel, if I recall correctly, it's 25 Chaplimos we've done already. Um, it's, a, it's a large number. So don't quote me on that. But without further ado, I'll now start a conversation with our um, with our guests. Um, uh, on one hand, we have Rosana Castiglioni, Rosana uh, um, from Universidad Diego Portales, and Andres Roberto Cipani from Universidad de San Andres. Uh, both of them friends of this uh, friends of this house, and we're very happy to see them uh, here. Uh, Rosana Castiglioni. Um, at Universidad de Ego Portales, has a degree in sociology for Universidad de la República in, in Uruguay, and has a PhD in political science from the University of Notre Dame. Um, and she's done a wide range of very interesting uh, achievements throughout her career, um, and is well known for her work in social policy. Um, has been visiting scholar at the at Harvard University, at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, University of Leiden, and uh, the University of Oxford's Harris Manchester College. Um, and on the other hand, we have uh, Andres uh, Roberto Cipani. Andres Cipani also has a PhD in political science from the University of California, Berkeley and is currently at the Department of Social Sciences Universidad de San Andres. Um, they are both interested in social policy. They are both interested in political economy of redistribution. And we know that this is a very important topic. Just, because, just before we started the, our session, we were just talking about, for example, the how transformative, how interesting this period was only a decade or, or more or so ago. And how we seem to be in a particular, in a different moment at the, uh, in the in the current uh, regional uh, landscape, and and I and I want to start with that reflection because I think it's it's in this area of social policy is one of those you know very interesting areas to think about the broad transformations that have taken place in Latin American politics and society more broadly. Um, and I'm going to start with. Rosanna, because um, on Rosanna's case, they we have two different works uh, in conversation today. Rosanna's case is a is a co-author uh, book that's being published by Cambridge University Press um, with a with a fantastic groups of of scholars as part of the series elements on on social policy and and it's on social policy expansion. And I will stop there just for a minute to to invite uh, Rosanna to tell us a little bit more about that project. Uh, it was a joy to, to, you know, to, to read that project, to see everyone involved. Tell us a little bit more about how it came into form and, and, and about how the project started. Well, you know, Lassa had a lot to do with that. Um, we, we have been working, all of the co-authors of this book, uh, on social policy, the variation of social policy. But then uh, most of us working on social policy um, got an interest in the this expansionary phase that went, you know, from the late 90s to Southern to 2013, that we see an expansion of social policy that was amazing. And that got a lot of attention. So, so we use uh, LASA as a place to uh, talk about these issues. And it was there that we wrote a paper that turned finally to be this these, uh, short book about social policy expansion. And I think uh, there are two things that I would like to highlight. Generally, um, political scientists tend to write books among two, 
three at the most authors. Um, and it's weird to have a book for, with several authors, you know, writing uh, at the same time, which was a challenge. And the second challenge is that it was a multidisciplinary group. So some of us came from uh, political science, there was an economist, there was a sociologist. So, um, and that was challenging, but very interesting. Very, very interesting. I am very curious about why it was a challenge and about the, the interdisciplinary dynamic. And, and, and I can tell you, at the moment, at the moment I, I saw the project, I thought this must have been really interesting because it's like a bullet, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a short book. Uh, condensed, you gotta go in agreement uh, with what's gonna be in there. Uh, I'm gonna get back to you on that point, but first I wanna go to Andres's uh, article. And in Andres's case, uh, we are uh, we have an article uh, to discuss in this in this chat lemos, and it was an article that was uh, awarded with the uh, prize for best article for the section of political institutions and processes at, at LASA. Um, Andres, can you tell us a little bit about your about your piece and how it came into form? You know, we're going from a collective work in Rosanna's case to an individual work in your case. Yes, in my case, uh, uh, I wrote the piece on um, on the Lula government's uh, labor policies, but this article was part of a broader uh, project, which was my dissertation, which is actually my book project, which is on uh, the politics of uh, the welfare state during left-wing governments in Latin America. And basically what I do in this little piece uh, uh, about Brazil is kind of um, um, develop my, my broader argument that actually wants to explain why or, or what are the political conditions that make some left governments make more generous restitutive policies than others. And what I try to 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 convey in this article is a sort of a puzzling uh, finding, which is that uh, left to themselves, left presidents tend to do little redistribution uh, in the context of the post uh, post the, in the context uh, that came after the neoliberal reforms in the nineties, and actually it's only when left uh, presidents face a fragmented left movement that actually they are forced or have in incentives to uh, engage in more generous restrictive policies. So in the case of Lula particularly, what you see is a left leader that despite the fact that he's the, he's the head of the one of the most powerful uh, left parties in the region, has strong union supporting him, uh, he did little redistribution towards the formal working class. So this argument about strong presence engaging in little redistribution uh, actually applies beyond the, um, the Brazilian case. And I show that in the case of Argentina and Uruguay, that is also the case. So weak presence, paradoxically, are the ones that tend to do more redistribution. Thanks, Andres. And here, and here we're going. Here we are starting to tease out the, the you know, the, the the core of our conversation today. So on one hand, we have the broader social policy changes and the, what they were able to affect, and then the questions of why. And and you are seeking to make a contribution in a in a field that, as you are pointing out, has already very strong tropes about uh, how things are supposed to work or not supposed to work. Uh, the in your own case. Uh, not, there is nothing that is more, perhaps more individual in academic work than writing your first big work, you know, so to speak, a PhD thesis. We have a dissertation committee, et cetera, but it's essentially a, a very solitary individual enterprise. Um, how did you find um, yourself engaging with others in terms of sharing, with, with, uh, sharing your ideas? Were they well received right away? Were there, were, was there some resistance in terms of your theoretical advance and what you wanted to say? Um, how was your, um, your experience interacting um, and developing your idea throughout your, your PhD? 
No, I think uh, in general it was, I think, well received uh, uh, because it was, it was, having said that, because it is a little, uh, it is somewhat a counterintuitive idea. Uh, I had some some pushback from the ones, from the scholars working in more traditional uh, theories on the welfare state. I mean, the most seminal work or the most seminal theory on, on welfare politics is the power resource theory. That actually says the says the opposite. No, the stronger left presidents have are, the more restrictive policies uh, they will uh, engage in. No, if you have a parliamentary majority, if you have a you know a centralized party. But in my case, um, being an Argentinian <laughs> that lived through the Kirchner years, years, I was actually. Uh, that, that experience sort of uh, made me realize that that's not always the case. That sometimes, uh, and that, that, that was very central to, to all the Kirchner social policy strategy. You know? What I saw there in Argentina before I moved to the US to do a PhD thesis is, was that the most uh, ambitious social policy initiatives, for example, the, the launch of the Asignación Universal por Hijo, which is the kind of Bolsa de Familia in, in Argentina. All these initiatives were done when the Kirchner's lost elections the, or they faced a lot of resistance from within the Paris movement. And uh, having seen that, when I started to, 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 to engage in a more comparative uh, scope, um, I, I realized that that was also the case in, in other countries, no? in Brazil, uh, in Uruguay, and so yeah and this brings me back to to rosana because it's very interesting i was going to ask you precisely about that journey about starting to study uh brazil and making sense of um of, of your uh vision outside of of argentina but i'm going to come back to to rosana because this points to to a broad trend that is that is regional that to discussions or arguments that needed that that uh elicit debates so i imagine rosanna that the development of the of the book uh actually reflected those debates and preferences and tensions and, and knowledge of different cases um would you like to tell us a little bit more about your your collaboration and in that in that space to to write the book i mean it it was very interesting. I think the difficult part was to decide what what was in and what was out. If it was going to be only the politics of social policy expansion, if it was going to include broader aspects. So I think we finally decide on the political economy of, of social policy expansion. And after we made that decision, it was very fluid. Um, the most difficult thing I would say is to work with people with different time zones. <laughs> so, you know, one was in the UK, another was in Richmond, mm. in California, in Chile. So it, it was to find that time among so, you know, very uh, several uh, scholars and then in different time zones was a, was a, a challenge in itself. But, uh, since we were really interested in 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 um doing a sort of um review of all the literature that has been published about the political economy of expansion um after we decide what we were going to include like for example um the main objectives you know we wanted to uh take a stock of the field we wanted to uh, characterize ex this expansionary period from 2000 to 2013, and also wanted to get into the explanation, you know. Uh, after we took th these decisions, it was very fluid. It was not problematic at all. That's that's actually, that's very interesting. First of all, with the time zones, I, I completely sympathize with, with you. And the Charlemos team sympathizes with you. You know, if you look at, if you look at us, before, when Andres was in, in the UK, for example, we had to coordinate Australia, UK, and, and, and North and South America. It was, it was very interesting. But that points, of course, to different logistics and, and approaches 
to the to the book how did you how did you decide not so much what to include but did you have any problem deciding what to exclude for example specific cases or specific um explanations that you decided not to not to engage with um what guided those those decisions well the first thing I, I and it was very early we decided to concentrate in academic literature and with this we are not saying that uh, the work produced by i don't know international financial institution think tanks and whatever uh is not important it is but since we were uh, focused on explanatory factors, uh, we thought that we needed to uh, focus on academic literature. Then the attention, I think, had to do with contradictory uh, evidence that comes from either from quantitative work and uh, qualitative work. Mm -hmm. So in some case studies, there is you, you, I mean, there, there is um, enough evidence to say perhaps, I don't know, ideological issues have to do with this, you know, what political parties in power or not. But then some quantitative studies say that it is not that important, you know, that there are other factors. And, and, and you know, referring to what uh, Andres was saying in my own work and, and the collective work, I mean, we we really realize that um, electoral competition is a crucial factor. Mm -hmm. So political parties do not behave the same way when they barely win an election and they had a huge space. Uh, political parties are competitive. They want to win the, the next election. And when they see that the difference between, you know, the second is is really um, tight, they, um, in a way, uh, accommodate their social policy offerings. And this is something that was has been studied a lot in, in the case of Europe, uh, expansion of social policy in Europe, but much less in Latin America until recently. There are several works that have incorporated that. And, and, and now, if you see, for example, um, uh, left-wing governments are talking about security, for example, which is a topic, a, a policy area that is characteristic of right-wing governments. And in the same way, sometimes right-wing governments get closer uh, to the left because they need the, the votes of the center. It's like Margaret Thatcher said, the NHS is safe with us. Yes, 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 uh, absolutely. And, and and as you say, that that's definitely one of the contributions, right? I mean, showcasing uh, perhaps new new works that hadn't been taken into account as as shaping the field. Uh, and we're gonna, mm -hmm. I think we we should come back to that to that question to that issue of how how you see the field evolving and what kind of new questions seem to be emerging from from that exercise of of stock taking. And, and I think that gives us a good opportunity to to go back to to Andres and and Andres one of the um, one of the aspects that I that I really enjoyed about your work was it really made me think about the logics the dynamics of the connections between uh, different groups and particularly uh, union leaders and and the party uh, apparatus and sometimes as we know those those intra dynamics. Of, of no, relational dynamics get obscured, no, don't get documented, get lost in the translation of you no know, quantitative, qualitative work. Tell us a little bit more about how you how you tackle studying studying that. I'm 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 fascinated by it. Well, <laughs> it took a lot of time and a, uh, and it took a lot of uh, some time. It took me some time developing the the trust. Uh, Ties between me and and the and the union leaders, the party leaders. I had to. I, I mean, I traveled to Brazil re, re, several times between two uh, across a, a time span of five years. Uh, uh, there were some people that I interviewed. I think three or four times. You know? um, so I think it's uh, one of the things I learned in the field, doing field work. Uh, I mean, I had done field work before, but uh, 
I think one, one important thing is that uh, de developing that personal trust is crucial. And sometimes you don't do that with one interview. Uh, sometimes you have to like uh, uh, visit some person, some union leader or party leader throughout the years, build some trust, create some interest. And, uh, and I think that that makes a difference. Uh, yeah. I mean, be, being a foreigner also helps, I think. Being a foreigner also helps. I was I, I was going to ask you about that because it's actually, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've been, as, as you might know, I'm very interested in the role of informal connections in shaping how politics works. And in the case of, in my case, for example, it's been the judiciary. And in particular, I started studying Venezuela. Well, we all know what happened to the Venezuelan regime over the course of time as it became increasingly autocratic it became increasingly difficult to, 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 to get access, to have access to that information. And I think you're pointing out that it's not only an issue of transparency, it's an issue also of trust. It's an issue, is, issue of access and being able to, to connect with, your, with, uh, the, with the participants to, to, to explore those issues. And how did you go about, for example, um, what, what questions did you, um, did you start with or, or was it an iterated process or just yeah. Opportunity that you have seen. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I think when you do interviews, I mean, uh, there are two, two two risks I try to avoid. One is being so empathic with the with the with the person being interviewed that he sells you or she sells you his or her vision, and you learn nothing. Or you can be too critical or too inquisitive, and that will get you nothing. Also, so I try to. So one thing I usually do is first I, I try to 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 spend the, the first ten minutes of the interview making the person uh, the person comfortable, ask them about themselves, how they became inner leaders, about their biographies, their political or union trajectories. But I also, I mean, in my case, my, my dependent variable is public policy. Mm -hmm. so, so before you, they, my, I, I never do an interview, uh, I mean, without any prior information. I tend first to use like uh, archival data, new, newspaper data to understand like the sequence and the positions of the different political actors in the process I'm interested in. And once I have that map, clear in my mind, only then I make the interview. So that gives me some position to, to ask questions in a, in a, in a, in a critical manner. You know? So for example, if the union, union leader tells me, no, we, are, we were against, uh, I don't know, policy X, I can then ask, ask him or her, wait, you were against it, but then in, 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 in day X, you change your position and you supported that or, or you bargained that. So I think that's, that's crucial. Never doing like a, an interview, like blindsided, you know. I think that's that's like the worst. In my in my my humble opinion, that's the worst mistake you one can make. Uh, I, I, I agree with you absolutely, and that preparation is 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 essential. And your and and your point, I think you're pointing out the need for for so-called not only due diligence for having a, a no good mm. idea of what you're after how that is connected to particular elements of your theory these are all very important uh lessons to share with our uh, with our students with our phd students or students who are interested in 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 research and as you're mentioning it's a it's a craft it's something that you learn that you learn by doing uh as well yeah totally and um, and with this and this point, I'm going to uh, come to to Rosanna because in my notes, um, there is in both of your uh, research, I imagine in the in the context of doing of writing the book uh, or writing the article, there were elements that surprised you, cases, for example, or ideas that generated contention. In Rosanna's case, in the context of a of a large group, or in your case, Andres, uh, for example. Uh, ideas, hypotheses, expectations that weren't verified in your own in your own research, or cases that you think you would have liked to explore but you didn't explore. Can you tell us a little bit more about those surprises, so to speak? And Rosanna, um, I, we can start with you. Uh, well, 
the, the argument we develop in the in the book is like democracy uh, was a sort of mo motive for expansion. Uh, the resources available because of the commodity boom uh, provided the opportunity. And then that policy legacies uh, shape the character of social policy in Latin America that has been a segmented expansion of social policy. Uh, but when we we try to zoom in this uh, segmentation, we realize that there is quite, I, I mean, there is some uh, information about uh, segmentation by, by social class. That is something mm -hmm. that we, we expected by labor status, by gender, but then uh, information about segmentation by race, by ethnicity, but by immigration status, for example, uh, is really scarce. Which I mean, I was shocked because I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't worked on this issue. So that was really interesting. And the other uh, thing. Think, uh, why, why do you think that? I'm sorry for interrupting, Rosan. Why do you think that is the case? Why do you think it was? I mean, I mean. It, it speaks to biases, I imagine, and in the literature, but it's 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 interesting. It's it's alarming, I would say. Yeah, I it's think, alarming. Yeah, I think it might have to do with the fact that um, if if you look at the trajectory of social protection in Latin America, you will see that as as Mesalago says, uh, there were some pioneer countries in terms of of social security systems that developed at the beginning of the 20th century. The case of Uruguay, Chile, Argentina, um, to a lesser degree, other countries. But then the rest of Latin America didn't have um, uh, formal workers in a way. You know, it was most of the workers were infor informal workers, and there was not a lot of interest in these countries for obvious reasons. If you are interested in policies, you look at the uh, at the usual suspects, you know, uh, and 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 then I don't know uh, Afro the Afro descendant population, indigenous people are uh, concentrated mostly in the countries that had been most understudied. So Central America, in contrast to the Southern Cone, we know much less, you know. Um, so and I am an editor of a journal, and I have to tell you, we receive a lot of papers from Brazil, on Brazil, on Argentina, on Mexico, but then other countries really, we never or almost never receive um, case studies that study some countries, you know. So I think it might reflect the trajectory of social policy, and then of course I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't want to believe that there is a bias, but there might be a bias, you know. Um, as I, as I'm listening to you, this is very interesting, right? Because this opens the door for discussions about epistemology, about who, about how, about knowledge production, and and you know, it goes back to to and then there are other priorities that that enter in into why. We had, we see more publications on one some countries than others. It yes. is it is fascinating, and and I would and actually I have a, a follow up question on that note for for Andres. But first, I wanted to give him an opportunity to tell us a bit more about what surprised him in in the context of his own work. Um, I think two things. Uh, one, I, I think I, I mentioned this a little bit in when you asked me your first question was that, um, you know, left presidents are not always eager to expand social policy. Um, so when you look at Brazil, Lula, you no, know, Lula is probably one of the you know flagship presidents of the left. And you, you look at Lula's government and it's, it has been very restitutive. It did both the familia, it, uh, it increased the minimum wage, uh, it increased formalization. But, but that's the picture. One of the advantages of doing an in-depth qualitative study is that when you look at the process, that was not automatic. The path was not self-evident, not obvious. And when you look at some of the emblematic policies of, the, of Lula, for example, the, the increase of, of the minimum wage, which was even more 
it has a it had a bigger redistributive impact than Bolsa Familia. Uh, that was not something that Lula wanted to do at the beginning. It was something that actually was very resisted by Lula during the first years of his administration. And it was actually only after he received a lot of pressure from within the left movement that he actually uh, uh, finally accepted uh, increasing the minimum wage. And, that, and what is that? Why is that? Because left presidents are actually torn be between two different uh, forces. On the one hand, their base, which wants more redistribution, but they're also torn by the forces of capital. And, and these forces are stronger than ever after the 90s. Mm -hmm. And presidents have also, have also to attend to those forces that finally determine the level of investment in the country and so the level of, of uh, employment, et cetera. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the preferences of political actors are more complex that, than the ones we usually see in the theory, no? So when you, I was actually, you know, studying like the, the key actors I studied were presidents, ministers, union leaders, and business leaders. Right? So, and, and, and the, and the assumption, assumption with which you come to the field is that unions will defend workers, business leaders will defend business and, and so forth. And that's not actually a case because I mean, union leaders, for example, as any politician, they are first and foremost interested in their own political careers or professional careers. So as you, Rosanna, or you, Raul, are interested in, you know, becoming more successful or having more prestige, union leaders are not, dif are not different from regular people. They're interested in advancing their professional careers. And in some countries, that might entail defending worker interests, for example, that's the case in Uruguay or in Argentina. But in Brazil, their professional interests are completely different. The only way union leaders can, they, um, let's say, uh, improve their professional career is by going up in the party ranks. And so because of that different incentive structure, they tend to be more loyal to the party than to, to unions, uh, sorry, than to the union base. And that gave Lula a lot of leverage over unions and workers. And that led, uh, finally, to, to Lula engaging in too little restrictive policy, especially towards the former working class. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that the political incentives of unions, ministers, change, if you look at one country or another, you have to see the broader political and professional context in which these uh, leaders operate to understand what they're looking for. Yeah, that's that, that's that's fascinating. And by and, and and by the way, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, and this is another note that I that I took that I wanted to share with you. Um, Latin American politics has a lot to offer, as we know, to comparative politics. Sometimes that become, that's absolutely evident for us. It tends, it is not necessarily evident to to some colleagues who do comparative politics work outside of of, of Latin America. But I was as I was listening to to your explanation, Andres. Uh, that's, for example, very interesting for observing. I mean, your 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 approach. It's very interesting for analyzing uh, patterns of relations between Labour Party, the Labour Party here in Australia at the subnational level, mm. for instance, and the, and the. Uh, and the unions, and I see it is pretty much if you read any newspaper here, is is kind of uh, common common commentary, common fodder. Um, but but That's again, uh, there is quite a bit. You know, it comes back to this idea that what we learn from the region can be very very useful um, in the uh, in the field to expand the field um, overall. And 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 I wanted to ask you to ask both of you uh, based on both of your research projects are fairly new. You were able to uncover some works and some ideas that haven't been, that are you know, fairly um, uh, fairly novel. Um, you can also see some of the trends or some of the questions or some of the topics that, that need research in, in social policy in the Latin American context. Plus, of course, it's 2023 and we know the region is continues to change and the context continues to change. So what do you see as some of those interesting uh, trends that, 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 that are, uh, that 
could be, for instance, of interest for new PhD students, for colleagues who are you know, trying to open a new, a new project. And I'll start with you, uh, Rosana. Yeah, um, there were two, two things that were also surprising that there was not enough information besides uh, these structural factors behind um, segmentation of social policy. One is that there is not that much research on, on state capacities. I mean, there are works, for example, Sara Nidieski's book is a great book and it shows how important state capacity is. But but I I don't know I I thought it was going to be a much more important issue and I think during the pandemic we discovered how important the state capacity is so I wouldn't be surprised in in if in the future years we are going to see much more um, research on uh, on state capacity the other thing that was um, interesting is that if you look at the literature on social policy up to the 1990, there was a lot of interest in the effect of that international financial institution and international factors had on social policy. Okay. But uh, later on, um, in the with the exception of low low income countries that need um, uh, credit to produce a reform, there is much less production. And there are things that I don't know, you know, like, for example, China as a new player in Latin America, where are they investing? Is this affecting social policy in a way? Questions like that has have not been um, taken into consideration that much in comparison, again, to previous decades. So. That's something that I, I I don't know if it will be a trend, but I hope it will be incorporated in in new dissertations. No, I, I it's I agree with you, right? I mean, the state capacity became very quickly after, uh, particularly after the pandemic, the elephant in the room, and and we and perhaps we had we it had already been pointed out before, but not not properly studied and intersected. With with other factors, and and Andres, what you know, your research looks mostly as the dynamics of, of motivations. For instance, um, what what are some of the trends that you see emerging on that on that side? I think there there are two things that uh, I think uh, we need more more papers or more books on this. One is uh, I would say labor policy in general. I mean. M much of the work on welfare policies in the in the last I think thirty years or or twenty years let's say has has been on on social assistance you know transfers and let's say something on pensions but there are few scholars working on labor policies and and I think that's that's something that uh, uh, needs more more attention and particularly on that point I think there's a new uh, mm -hmm. a new issue that is becoming more and more salient, and that is the, 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 the organization and the regulation of uh, platform workers, Uber drivers. Um, I think mm. that's something that, uh, that, that, that is being uh, studied a lot in the US. For example, Ruth, Ruth Collier and Chris Carter have recently published an article on, in perspective on politics on that. And I think that's, that's something that it's becoming very uh, politically salient in Latin America, but we don't see many scholars working on that. And the other the other area uh, in which I have I have I have been writing a paper on is is the, obviously the the, the 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 politics of welfare retren retrenchment under the under the populist right, you know, under the new right. Mm -hmm. And I think you know the last times that we've seen on, on welfare retrenchment in Latin America were the ones that uh, extensively studied uh, the neoliberal policies in the 90s and welfare retrenchment uh, that took place during that period. But we need new studies that study how social policy is being changed, you know, or has been changed by Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, 
La Casse Pou in, in Uruguay, Macri in Argentina. I mean, Sara Nieweki and Shani Prado have, have written something on that that is, that's very interesting, but I think we need a, a more studies on that because I think the pattern of wealth retrenchment does not resemble patterns of welfare retrenchment in the past, nor do they follow the, I think, the, the empirical patterns do not fit with the, with the theories uh, the traditional theories on welfare retrenchment. I'm referring to Pearson's work or Hacker's work. I think something very different is happening in Latin America. And if I may add something yeah. to that, um, Absolutely. the project that I'm working on now uh, is a project on uh, what happened with right-wing governments under the expansionary era. And if you, uh -huh. if you look at, at governments uh, of countries uh, that had right-wing government, there was also expansion there. Uh, Fox introduced opportunidades, I mean the PAN mm -hmm. in Mexico, uh, President Saca in El Salvador, Martinelli in Panama, in, in Colombia. I mean, if you look at, Colombia is amazing. In 19, uh, at the beginning of the 1990s, there was 30, 32% of coverage of healthcare. By uh, 2015, mm. there was over 90%. And, and the president that expanded the most uh, was uh, Uribe, the most right-wing president. In, so, uh, well, in, in Chile, Chile has the most generous uh, uh, maternity leave of Latin America, and that was ex expanded under President Piñera. So, and if you look at Paraguay, that didn't have anything, Tecopora was introduced by the Partido Colorado. So, there is something there. Uh, the question, what I'm trying to answer now, which is not related to this project we were talking before, is under which condition is that right wing presidents uh, are willing to go against their own beliefs and, mm -hmm. and, and get into, into policy areas that traditionally they don't feel comfortable with. Um, and, and I conducted some interviews in, in Paraguay and, and in Colombia. I did field work there and it's fascinating, fascinating. Um, there are several There's things no. that, that the literature is not covering. It's what it's what we're, it's, it's, in, it's incredible. That's been a running a running thread throughout the the conversation. All, all the spaces that there are for mm. uh, for further for further work. And we and we are already having questions, by the way, on the webinar chat. And I of course uh, encourage our our participants to to participate to uh, share with us questions and and comments. And and I I didn't you know on, on that note of why certain policy decisions are made or not to what degree in in your work uh, Rosanna and Andres uh, you cover um, uh, policy experts expertise technocrats in the uh, here for example in 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 Australia in this area there has been increasing interest and work on consultants and on how, on how consultancy firms are, are driving the agenda, so to speak, in, the, in a neoliberal or, or, or post-neoliberal context, but even again, labor governments uh, using consultants as much as, as the right-wing parties or even more. So um, is this an area that you see as, as interesting or shifting in the current, in, in the current space or relevant for, for Latin America? Who, who should answer? And it's funny because I think I pointed to you, Rosanna, first, but it's because the two of you are in my screen and I did this. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can go first. Uh, I, I have studied a lot that issue before for my first book. And also, if you study Chile, you, you have to deal with mm. technocrats because uh, here, I always say that Chilean economists that introduced reforms uh, in the previous decades are monjas laicas del capitalismo. I don't know how to say that in uh, wow. religious nuns of <laughs> capitalism or ne of neoliberalism. They uh, And this is, uh, for example, in some policy areas, you see it mostly. 
And in other policy areas, it's not that relevant. For example, in the area of, of uh, PTCs, uh, the conditional cash transfers, uh, the, com the epistemic communities and diffusion theory uh, is very important. It's really very important on how technocrats are going from one country to the next to um, to work on. And, and, and that came a lot in my interviews, for example, for other, another project. So uh, you, you asked, why did you introduce these policies? Well, I studied in Spain, mm -hmm. yeah. and I met someone from that work on Bolsa Familia and another guy on Oportunidades, and I brought them to my country, and we blah, 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 blah. But in other areas, uh, for example, in, in healthcare, it doesn't work that way. Um, you see much less. Perhaps after the pandemic, uh, mm. you will have much more, I don't know, technocrats. And, but comparatively, I think that uh, it depends on policy area, I would say. Yeah, that's 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 re that's really interesting, and it makes me you know, think back about judicial reform, how and when it, it worked, and and why. You see a, a very similar approach: different types of experts working in different types of areas with different degrees of of success. And is, is that something that you contemplated at all in your in your work, uh, Andres? And I'm thinking your your uh, work on on the proximity or distance. From, from actors could dovetail nicely with questions about the relevance of, um, of experts, expertise, uh, policy making caters and, and so forth. To be honest, completely. So I come from a country, so I'm in the opposite. Uh, I'm in the opposite. Uh, I live in the opposite context of, of, of the one Rosanna was speaking to you about. He lives, she lives in, now in Chile where institutions and experts matter a lot. I come from Argentina, where institutions and experts don't, don't matter at all. So, <laughs> so I guess that sort of biased my research in terms of not, not uh, actually taking the time um, to, 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 to analyze that, that topic. Um, I'm not saying it's very important. It, it's probably very important, but that's not something that has been on your, on my, in my theoretical yeah, framing, yeah. but but I do I do I, I obviously I as I mentioned before before I do an interview I do two things first I do archival research and newspaper mm -hmm. research to understand the, the politics and before I do any 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 interview with a, with with a political actor I, in, in any in each country I interview you know 20, 30 experts on on, on the different areas to understand I mean. Uh, the, the the study object I'm interested in. Yeah. So so, so I, I use them more as uh, as inputs in my in my research than not so much as uh, my 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 study objects. No, it, it's it's yeah no very very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm I'm gonna come to one. We're almost almost at the end of our conversation. Is you know we've been chatting chatting here. I've been drinking my coffee. It's almost an hour, but I'm gonna go to Manuel's. Uh, I have a question myself, but first to Manuel's uh, question, but Rosanna's earlier comment about countries that get attention and the ones for which there is less published work, I wonder if she might illustrate some of what we may be missing. And also I wonder what she thinks about the value of studying smaller countries relative to what larger and more visible countries allow us to learn. And uh, Rosanna, you were pointing at some, you know, the importance of this, of this issue um, and I, yeah, I think the, you know the the floor is yours. What do you think? I I think we are sometimes blind blindsided when we don't uh, get with uh, you know you we don't study these countries that are less studied. And and for example, I was talking about uh, the role of international institutions. And it's not really a topic in the larger countries, but then when you go to the countries that are less studied in Central America or South America, like Paraguay, let's say, uh, you see this is an important issue because um, for them, the millennium goals are crucial. Yeah. You know, and these are topics that might be more or less solved in, I mean, some of them, for example, I don't know, access to to drinking water. 
So, so I think we are missing a lot. Um, I am also, I, I, I also believe that some, it depends on your research questions, because sometimes some of these small countries have something in particular that, that make them interesting. And I come from, I am Uruguayan by origin. So uh, Uruguay doesn't exist, you know, in the literature in comparison to the, you know, Argentina or Brazil or, but, but I think Uruguay is a very interesting country. It started to develop social policy even before some European countries. You have a cultural party that is center right that, was in the same mood uh, that Bismarck was, you know, anticipated by building social policy and generated trust from the popular sectors, but at the same time, very democratic. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things that are really unusual about this country. And these unusual countries, I think, deserve to be studied. Um, yeah. the, the case of Costa Rica, for example, well, there is much more uh, interest in Costa Rica than, than in other uh, Central American countries. But the way in which, for example, Panama is another fascinating country. We don't know. Fascinating and understudied. Understudied at all. I think Absolutely. it's very interesting. So I think case studies are very useful to deal with this country. Implemented with quantitative. Uh, research because, for example, uh, I don't know, there are several case studies that show that the left matter in social policy expansion. For example, in the, uh, in the Andes, social mobilization is crucial, but I don't know, in other countries, it, it doesn't work that way. So it, we also need quantitative research to complement this. Uh, no, no, and, and your point, yeah, and I want to compliment, no, thank you, Rosanne, I think those those are really good points, and and on that note as well, and I'm going to go back to Andres uh, uh, quickly, Andres, in your case, it's the, it's the opposite, right, I mean, you're looking at big countries, and in areas that might, uh, depending on, on, on what we study, might there might be wide variations of nationally. Uh, it, it's the case of Brazil. I mean, is this something that entered into your research uh, in in some way? And well, you've been studying Brazil now. You come from Argentina, that also has um, significant variation at the subnational level. And this coming from someone who comes from a from a state in Venezuela where I almost always raise their hand and say, "Ah, oh, no, 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 that's not how things work here in Maracaibo." So, um, <laughs> what? You, yeah, what what would you say in that respect? I think uh, in my case, the the study of like the, the subnational politics or social policy wasn't something I was focused on because I was, yeah, it was not, but I want to say something about the other topic you asked. That was the influence of small countries in, in theory development. Yeah, and yeah, for yeah, me, Uruguay, Uruguay was crucial. Ah, I came from Argentina when I saw that divisions within the left was, was well, the left, Peronism, I don't know, uh, were important. Then I looked at Brazil, which was like the opposite case, you know, what, where you saw a president that concentrated a lot of power and did, and, did, uh, and, and did little social policy. And then I discovered Uruguay, mainly uh, because of a book uh, written by Jenny Prio, but that, but that time it wasn't a book, it was a, 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 a dissertation thesis that she generously, generously uh, shared with me. And I saw there, uh, when, when I read her work, that some of the dynamics that were happening in Argentina, divisions within the left leading to, to more generous left, left policies, were also something that was happening in Uruguay during the Frente Ample administrations. And that led me to the... <laughs> to the <laughs> Realization that A, I had to go to Uruguay and do a third case against the advice of my dissertation advisors, which, which told me, which who told me, no, you're already doing two, two big countries, don't do a, a third one. And and and, th and second, doing this second case would allow me to to, to build a more comprehensive uh, a theory that would could travel more broadly by studying, you know country, another country which had divisions on the left, but in a more institutional fashion than in Argentina, where, where politics is a chaos. So I think Uruguay, so the, the small case was really important in terms of 
uh, uh, theory building. Ex excellent, and and what's included you now the the value of the, its value on a small end design, um, so to speak. No, that's that's fantastic. Well, we're almost there, and I want to give both of you um, an, an opportunity to tell us just a bit more about what you're working on and what's next, if if you would like. Any project that is exciting you right now and what is uh, what, are, what you are um, developing at the moment? Well, since I became dean, I have a lot of information and very little time. Uh, so I would like to get into everything that I gathered through uh, field work and, and work more on my project on the expansion of social policy under right-wing countries. And I'm trying to compare different dynamics um, in the same way that Andres was saying, uh, comparing a country we know nothing about, Paraguay, uh, with Colombia, that is a country that generated a lot of attention, at least in some policy areas, and Chile that is a country that has been widely studied. So that's my project now, right? No, that's, Expansion and the right in governments. That's very exciting. Congratulations, Decana. And I know <laughs> that, that finding a bit of time to do research in those circumstances. Yeah, you get all, so, yeah, all, all my sympathy. And 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 Andres, you are you you are in the in the tenure track assistant professor. Yes. Uh, yes. Track. So, so I, under a lot of pressure too. So, Yes, so I'm finishing my book, but I'm also working on, on, on a second project, which actually uh, unfolded after I, I did my dissertation because I actually studied like the 20-year period of, of left-wing governments. So I studied what happened there, uh, during that period in terms of social policies. And when I was writing the conclusions, one obvious topic that I had to study was what happened with all those social policies that were expanded during during left wing governments once these parties were out of power, and that led me to the second project, which is about welfare retrenchment under right wing governments, comparing Temer and Bolsonaro in Brazil with uh, the Macri government in Argentina. And I think, and I think that I'm completely puzzled and motivated by the by the results I'm I'm finding. We should combine our work, you know. I mean, that's 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 it wasn't deliberate. This wasn't deliberate. <laughs> I, I think but, I mean now I realize that we should we should do something to her. I mean I, yeah. I, I've known Rosanna for a time now some time now, but I didn't know she was working on this. So I think it yeah. we should combine forces. Yeah. That's fantastic. And I can tell you right away on behalf of behalf of, of Chad Lemos that we would love to have you back. You know, working together, working in your respective projects in whatever shape or form you 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 like. But we've we've really enjoyed the the opportunity. And on behalf of the Charlemos team, I want to thank you wholeheartedly for your uh, contribution and for the conversation today. I really enjoyed thank it you. personally. And best of luck with your respective work. Thank, thank you so you, much Raul. for the invitation. <laughs>